We continue with the introduction to the word. Lead us in your truths, O God. Teach us your ways and your paths. Into whatever journey lies before us. Lead on, Holy Spirit, lead on. Today's reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, beginning with the 20th verse. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. Here ends the reading. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. I don't know how many of you remember the television ad campaign Wendy's had, oh, some years back. It featured two hamburgers, hamburger A and hamburger B, and people were shown the two hamburgers and they were asked which they would prefer, which one, and hamburger A looked like, oh, it was like a soft bun and there was lettuce and tomato and cheese and the meat looked thick and juicy and hamburger B, the bun kind of would look stale, the meat looked like it had been overcooked, if, if not even freeze dry. What? You don't remember that? What? Hey, wait, here's one of them. Sir, would you choose hamburger A, a Wendy's hamburger made with fresh beef, or hamburger B made with beef that's been frozen? B, phenomenal investment potential in frozen beef. Think about it. The other guy's paying top dollar for fresh. I snatch up this baby when nobody else will touch it. But isn't fresh better? That's the beauty. First thing you know, you got to run on fresh beef. Supplies dry up. Bingo, I got frozen. I'm sitting on a gold mine. Most people like the taste of hamburgers made with fresh beef, like Wendy's, the best burgers in the business. Did you remember that one? There were a whole series of them. Well, listen, I'll show you a second one. Let's roll the second one. Sir, would you choose hamburger A, a Wendy's hamburger that's made fresh, or hamburger B that's pre-made so it sits around? A B, because it sits around. I'm a trucker, and I need something made for the long haul, and that baby looks like it'd hang around for six, maybe seven stays. But wouldn't the fresh Wendy's hamburger taste better? It might. But I can eat this bee burger in Shaky Town and still be tasting it in Salt Lake. <laughs> Most people prefer the taste of fresh hamburgers, like Wendy's, the best burgers in the business. Yeah. You want A or B? Now, the interesting part about those commercials is uh, most people pick B. When given a choice, we often make poor decisions for the wrong reasons, don't we? And when we realize what we've done, we often make excuses excuses for our poor decisions. Our own pride won't let us admit to failure. Our own pride won't let us, well, to use kind of a biblical concept, our own pride won't let us repent, won't let us, well, change. Now you may or may not be surprised by the number of excuses I have heard for persons not being uh, at church, for not attending church. I suspect that people are telling me their excuses because they want me to somehow give them permission for not being there, and frankly, I'm not the one they need to talk to about not being there. 
It's kind of the moral equivalent of telling your friends why you didn't go to work instead of telling your boss or your coworkers. It's kind of like telling the person at Starbucks why you didn't go to school instead of telling your teacher why you weren't there. But I still do hear the excuses. I, they'll say, Pastor, I go to brunch on Sundays. Pastor, it's my only day to sleep in. Pastor, I don't like to get dressed up when I don't have to go to work. Pastor, people only talk about money in church. Pastor, I don't get anything out of it, and frankly, your sermons and the service are too long. Pastor, there is no command that says I need to go to church every Sunday. Now, you may have heard those, you may even have used those. But there's another set of persons who when they explain why they don't go to church, why they're not part of a faith community, well, these are persons who have been emotionally wounded, bruised by the church or people in the church. The church has been a stumbling block to them hearing, encountering the good news of Jesus Christ. Well, in fact, they came, like the Greeks in our text today, uh, they came to a faith community, and they came to hear, to witness, to be part of the good news of Jesus Christ. The Greeks came to the disciples, and they wanted to see Jesus. And the church got in the way. There's a book I, I uh, read some years ago called An Unstoppable Force. It's by Erwin McManus. Uh, and uh, he makes the observation that Americans are more spiritual than they have been in at least 100 years. But he found out that as people were searching for a, an encounter with God, as they were searching for a, a faith community uh, that, that was proclaiming the healing, the forgiveness, and the grace of God, uh, church was the last place they looked, and oftentimes when they did go to a faith community, they felt rejected, disappointed, and not welcomed. And so we in the church, when we hear, when we read about that kind, those kinds of stories, we began making excuses. Rather than learning from them, we begin to explain uh, those person's inability, well, to see what's really going on here, right? We, we begin to explain why we in the church don't need to change. And it's not the first time that the church has tried to make excuses to the world. I mean, the gospel writers found themselves trying to explain why people in Jesus' own day, why they didn't want hamburger A, and why instead they were choosing hamburger B, why they put Jesus Christ to death. Matthew, for instance, you remember, tells a story of Jesus, and Jesus is healing on the Sabbath. You remember the story? And the religious leaders found that offensive. They say in Matthew 12, how dare Jesus violate one of God's commandments? I mean, their excuse was righteous indignation. I mean, they were offended that Jesus would put the health and well-being of any human above a God-given commandment that we need to rest on the Sabbath. They were so offended, in fact, that they began to look for a way to have Jesus arrested. I mean, they were trying to defend God. Here's a sad thing. I have never heard anyone say they didn't come to church because God didn't want them there. I've only heard people say that they quit coming to church because church people didn't want them there. We're just acting like the religious leaders of Jesus' day when this happens. We are claiming our own righteous indignation and we are denying access to to God's people, we are setting up prerequisites for why and how somebody should come to worship. Or worse yet, 
We're setting up prerequisites. We're setting up walls, stumbling blocks for people hearing about the news of God's love and forgiveness and healing. In the Gospel of John, we find a, a different way of excusing the religious actions of those leaders. John says that the religious leaders were jealous of Jesus. They were jealous of Jesus' intimate relationship with the Creator, with God. Remember, our text today is happening after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And the religious leaders are fearful that they will lose their place in the hearts and minds of the people. That's what's going on. So they make plans to put Jesus to death. It's better, they say, for one person to die than the whole social order to collapse. Not many of us are, are willing to change the status quo either. We only know how to serve hamburger beef. And we are not about to take cooking classes to learn how to change up our recipe. I mean, we say things like, well, it's just the way we are. It's just the way we've always done things. It's the way it's always been. It's like the sign. Look, look at this sign. What's the sign say? It says, at my house, you will be served a three-course meal. Eat it, like it, and thank me when you're done. How many times has the church been a house like that? Eat it, like it, and thank me when it's done. I, I, I stand before you today to say that it's long past due for the church to take some cooking lessons, and it's time for us to try some new recipes. We might say we want people to join this community of faith. We might say we want people to experience the joy of the good news of God's love, healing, and grace, but we all know it won't happen if it means we got to change. If it means that we're not going to do something like we've always done it. If you're, at, if you're saying to me that I need to believe and act and live in a new way, whoa, 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 pastor, I want hamburger B. I want the one that's been sitting there for a while. But the gospel message? The gospel message is Jesus did not come into the created world, into our lives to condemn us, but to give us life. And Jesus came to express and to share that all of God's people are loved, no matter where they live, no matter who they are. You know, God offers us something way better than hamburger B, and frankly, better than hamburger A. But oftentimes, we continue to, to miss the point. Kind of like the disciples. Did you catch what happens in the whole text today? Did you catch that the Greeks come uh, and they say, we would like to see a Jesus. And the text says they come to Philip. Sir, they say, we, we, would, we wish to see Jesus. And, and Philip doesn't know what to do with that. So Philip goes to Andrew. And then Andrew and Philip probably had this big conversation like, you know, oh my gosh, this is scandalous. These people want to see Jesus. I don't know, should we let him see Jesus? Probably there's like whispering going on, right? Oh my God, do we do it? should we do this? Should we do it? Like, oh, this was not right. And then they finally, I guess because they needed to go together, this, because it was, you know, they're going to have to support each other because they wouldn't know what Jesus was going to say to this. Lord, Rabbi, there's some Greeks that want to see you, some people that want to see you. And Jesus says, well, the hour has come. Now, remember in early John, Jesus at the wedding, remember? And they ran out of good wine. Remember, they ran out of wine. And they go to Jesus' mother, hey, we've ran out of wine, remember? And she says, you know, uh, uh, son, son, they've run out of wine. You've solved the problem. And Jesus says, hey, my time hasn't come. But in our gospel text today, Jesus says, the hour has come. And Jesus then goes on to say that I, and I, and Jesus says, when I am lifted up upon the earth, in other words, when I am crucified, killed, 
I will draw all people to myself. So, for those of us uh, checking in today at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church and seeing what I'm talking about, well, well, we, we've encountered Jesus. We've seen and, and encountered the power of God's love in our churches, in our faith communities. We've seen and encountered the, the power of God's love in our neighbors and in one another. We don't need to protect the world from Jesus. And we don't need to protect Jesus from the world. We've got to stop being stumbling blocks and barriers to the good news. As I close the message today, I pray that God will forgive us when we become stumbling blocks to those encountering God's love and grace. I pray that God will give us the courage to follow Christ and to proclaim to all that all are welcome. May God help us to be witnesses to the boundless, limitless love of Jesus Christ. Amen.